will you all tell me, prompt me if I forget or repeat the question uh, if I forget because sometimes I, I do that. Um, it's warm in here. 600 sophomores were here <laughs> heating up the place. Um, but I hope it will be all right for us. We're going to spend about 50 minutes in Q&A and then we will have you go upstairs uh, to meet with your sons and daughters and then go out and about on, on the Boston University campus and, and get a better sense of, of how things are going. So the first thing I'm going to do, we've assembled a team. Remember this morning I talked about our team structure. So we wanted to get you to have a kind of visual impression of what a team looks like. Uh, we've assembled a team plus a few more folks. Uh, and so I'm going to have these people introduce themselves, where you're from, where you, so where you grew up, what you teach, what your research field is. You know the drill. Matt Parfit. All right. Hi, and welcome. Uh, my name is Matt Parfit. Um, I'm chair of the rhetoric division, and uh, I teach freshman rhetoric. On an actual team, there would be two of me, as there are two rhetoric instructors on each freshman team. Um, I was born in the UK, but uh, emigrated to Canada when I was just eight years old and uh, grew up in Montreal. Came down here in uh, 1985, I think, so I've been down here a long time, teaching at uh, BU for 21 years, I think. Uh, my research is in uh, composition studies chiefly and secondarily uh, literature of the World War I period. Good afternoon. My name is Peter Busher, and I'm the chair of the Division of Natural Sciences and Mathematics here in the college. Um, I'm originally from San Francisco and grew up there and, and lived out there for ha about half of my life, and then I emigrated back east to Boston, and I've been here the other half. Um, I've been here longer than Matt has, but less than Jay has, so I, they, they put me in between them because I represent kind of the middle ground, I suppose. I'm a uh, biologist by training, a mammalian ecologist, and I've spent most of my professional life studying beaver behavior, population dynamics, uh, and biology. <coughs> Good afternoon. My name is Jay Corin. Uh, I'm from uh, International Falls, Minnesota, and uh, I moved here not only for the culture of Boston, but for the weather above all. Um, I am chairman of the Division of the Social Sciences. I'm trained as a historian. Uh, I'm an intellectual historian. I focus on the intersection of politics and religion in my writing and research. And in the Social Science Division, we uh, offer a course that is interdisciplinary in the social sciences, which includes economics, history, anthropology, and sociology. Thank you and welcome. Uh, my name is Adam Sweeting. I am the acting chair of the Humanities Division uh, right now. I grew up in a small town in the Hudson River Valley called Dobbs Ferry, Dobbs Ferry, New York. Um, I studied uh, philosophy as an undergraduate at Clark University out in Worcester and then uh, American Literature and American Studies at, at uh, New York University. Uh, I've been teaching here at Boston University since 1996. And uh, my, uh, as, as chair of the uh, humanities department, I've been teaching in the sophomore program for the last several years, which is a philosophy-based course. The freshman uh, humanities course is more of a literature and art history-based course. Uh, and my uh, field of interest as a, as a researcher is in uh, American environmental writing and environment, American environmental thought and the history of, 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 these, of these fields. So welcome. <coughs> uh, hi again, uh, Stacy Godnick here. I'm the Associate Dean for Student Academic Life. I hail from the great garden state of New Jersey, from which we have, I think, a pretty large representation <laughs> today. Uh, went to Gettysburg College and got my degree in sociology, uh, worked for a few years and got my master's in higher admin at NYU, and started here in 1988. And um, I, as I said earlier, I'm responsible for um, the academic advising program here. Uh, so we have a staff of six professional advisors uh, uh, who will be working one-on-one -on -one with your sons and daughters throughout their stay here, beginning uh, at orientation. Hi, I'm Natalie McKnight. I'm so glad you could make it here today. I'm Associate Dean for Faculty Research and Development and Director of our fairly new Center for Interdisciplinary Teaching and Learning. 
Um, my chief area of publication is 19th century British fiction. I focus mostly on Dickens. Uh, I teach humanities courses, freshman and sophomore. Sometimes I've taught rhetoric as well. And normally I say that I am from Pittsburgh because I was born in Pittsburgh and I lived there for 14 years, but I have lived here and worked at Boston University for 23 years. And in the last two weeks, I've never been prouder to be a Bostonian. So I'm going to say today, I'm from Boston, the best city on the planet. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Meg Andrews. I am originally from Plymouth, Massachusetts. And I am a 2009 College of General Studies alum, a 2011 College of Communication alum. I'm currently enrolled part-time in the School of Education Higher Education Administration Program, and I work full-time for the university as the Parents Program Coordinator. So hopefully I'll get to know a lot of you over the next four years. Hello again, my name is Rachel Boyle. I'm an Assistant Director in the Office of Admissions. I'm from Concord, Massachusetts, and I actually just finished my Master's in the School of Education here at Boston University. Perfect, so if Adam would hold the mic, uh, because remember, those of you, as we answer questions, you need to be, for the folks online, you need to have the mic when you answer the question. We're going to, I, I've teed up a handful of slides about pathways to degrees, because I know you'll have some, some questions about that, of uh, the curriculum again, which is in your folder. Uh, for those people who are joining us uh, online, all of these things are on our website. So if you, obviously if you can't see what we're talking about right uh, this moment, you'll be able to access it on our website. So um, let's start with the questions. Uh, you're going to represent yourself, yourselves, and you're also going to ask questions for these folks who are silent out there uh, on the uh, webcast and um, what they might have. And usually the questions will cover the kinds of things that, that most people uh, are seeking to learn. So who would like to begin? Scared of being on television. <laughs> yes, sir, go ahead. Uh, first, I would like to offer the condolences on behalf of all of us from outside the uh, Boston area. Thank you. And also, if I may add to the Celtics fan here. My question is, uh, you know, how does a ch student transit from CPS to SNP after a couple of years? Good. Thank you. So, uh, condolences offered. Thank you so much. I began our capstone award ceremony with a moment of silence because I felt like I had to place it in some kind of context because it's a hugely celebratory day for our sophomores, and I didn't want to diminish that. But at the same time, one doesn't know how to respond to ordinary circumstances given the extraordinary circumstances of the last week. So thank you for that. Uh, the question has to do with how do students transition from the College of General Studies to, their, uh, to the junior year. So let me say, and I'm going to pass this to Meg, because Meg, you're the student who did it, but before, while she's getting the mic, I'm going to um, say something that I didn't say this morning, which is, by no preconceived quota, uh, no college says, oh, we can only take 80 of your students this year. Uh, students continue into the college of their choice as they've been prepared for that in their work with their, advising, their advisors. Uh, that being said, our pattern for many, many years is about a third of our students go on to the College of Arts and Sciences, about a third of them go to the College of Communication, about 18 to 20 percent to the School of Management, but they continue as well to, the, and these are smaller programs for sure, uh, Sergeant College of Health and Rehabilitation Sciences, um, Hospitality Administration, School of Education, Am I forgetting one? Anyone, Stacy? Sergeant. I mentioned sergeant. Yep. Uh, not uh, engineering. Absolute engineering. Not, as I said this morning, the College of Fine Arts as an automatic continuation. So, Meg, why don't you talk about your uh, transition? Sure. Um, well, first and foremost, I think the most important thing, um, and I'm, I think this was said before too, was that relationship with your advisor. Um, as freshmen, um, I think the most important relationship you have is that with your advisor. Um, it's really important to have open communication with them, to let them know right off the bat what you're thinking about studying, um, and because really they're the experts in the areas of to tell you what elective courses to be taking, what gateway courses you should be taking in order to make that transition. Um, with that said, it's kind of as simple as you know registering for those gateway courses, making sure um, you know you're participating in class and kind of getting the most out of your academic. Um, 
journey here at the College of General Studies while also being enrolled in those elective elective classes in those schools and colleges you wish to transition into. Um, and I can say it was a really easy transition for me. I transitioned into the, into the College of Communication um, and just based on the foundation I had here with the relationships I had with my professors, with that open relationship with my advisor, I felt extremely prepared. Um, you know, I had made sure I took the, the elective courses I needed to take in order to do so. Um, it was a very easy transition and you know, I got a lot out of the College of Communication once I was there too. I was that much more um, open to participating in class um, and developing a relationship with my professors. Um, but yeah, it really starts with that relationship with the advisor and they will really, really help students to determine what courses um, are most important and they should be thinking about taking their, their first two years here. The, 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 um, so specifically, the uh, matter of, remember, uh, we have the second, well, you don't, you're not going to remember this because I didn't say it this morning. We have the second largest freshman class in the university who starts in the College of General Studies. So we'll have about 550 or so freshmen who start with us. And therefore, we send in any given year 300, 200 students to the College of Arts and Sciences, 200 to the College of Communication, 80 or so to the School of Management. Your question was specifically about SMG, School of Management. Um, so Stacy, why don't you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, I think the, um, <clears throat> in addition to the academic piece, which uh, Meg hit you know, right on in terms of the, 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 the connection with the advisor is critically important, uh, is, is the, the co-curricular aspect too. So students are not at the College of General Studies in a bubble. So if, I know Meg was uh, a member of the Public Relations, public relations Student Society of America <laughs> chapter of PRSSSA. PRSSSSA something. <laughs> so, so, and, and, and so she was involved with that freshman year on. And we have students who are doing on the radio station films and management, the marketing association. So that, that's a key piece uh, of, of, the, of making the transition quite seamless. And for the School of Management, as, as uh, for the other schools and professional schools and colleges, there are prescribed courses that your sons and daughters will take in accordance with the advisor, uh, usually for management, it's, it's calculus or microeconomics. And, and again, if there's AP coming in, we can talk about other electives that, that the student would take in management. So it really begins. Uh, and then the transition into the junior year is, is simply you're halfway through after the College of General Studies, and then you continue on uh, to the School of Management and the other schools. And you, you finish with a degree. Your, 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 your diploma says a Bachelor's of Science in, in Business Management. And so you're, you're finishing and taking the courses that students who began in management are taking. Uh, Stacy, maybe keep the mic for one second. Uh, so I put up the continuation, the pathway sheet for the School of Management. Again, as I said, these are all on our website. We have 60 years of well-trod paths to all of these schools and colleges. You should also be aware that uh, students throughout the university are making a fair number of changes themselves. They might have started in the College of Arts and Sciences, but decide they want to transfer to the School of Management or start in engineering, decide they want to go to communication. So there's a, there's a good bit of this that's happening. Uh, the, the CGS students tend to stay connected very much with their faculty and with their advisors over their four years, for one thing. So I want to say that. Also, remember I put up the curriculum. And Stacy, talk a little bit about the School of Management, uh, what, the, what role the electives play in getting students with, uh, prepared for that through their gateway courses, whether they're at school, CGS or elsewhere, but we're talking about CGS. Right, right. And again, you know, before I do that, I just want to bring up another point is that the, the other piece here is that we're advising your sons and daughters, but we are also, we're, we're sort of in this unique position where we have them for two and then we send them off, although many stay in touch and, and keep connected, but we are connecting them with the advising, you know, one of my main roles is to, is to cultivate that uh, relationship with the other schools and colleges and the, and the folks there who do what we do here. So we're connecting students with the advisors before they become juniors in these other schools and colleges. So you want me to talk about... Talk about the gateway courses that... So, right, so, so the freshman year for, for management, you're taking calculus and economics, and in the second year, um, you're, you're starting to take the management course, the foundation course that students must earn a B minus in, uh, and that's business, society, and ethics, and a finance class. And then after that, they'll take accounting in the second semester of the sophomore year. And again, if students are coming in with AP calculus or micro, we can push those, the SMG courses um, to, to the spring of the freshman year. May I say also that some students, just one second, that some students um, 
uh, some parents and students often ask, how many of your students are undecided? And I say about 98% of them, but they don't know it yet. That is to say that one of the things about the College of General Studies is that they have the uh, array of schools and colleges to, to continue to as juniors. But it's really important to start to talk to your advisor about what do you imagine and to talk with other students. Remember, sophomores, juniors, seniors, some of the best contacts your sons and daughters will make will be in the residence halls. And you know, somebody who's in biomedical engineering and the student may say, well, tell me about that. So the, the way that they're going to find their major is not just in a one-to-one -one relationship with their advisor. It's, a, it's coming from multiple perspectives, how, how this is. Follow-up question. Okay, uh, the question yeah. has to do with uh, AP courses, how those are evaluated, uh, how the, the student progresses with AP, how those get assessed. I'm going to have Stacy pick up the question of assessment. Remember that students who start in the College of General Studies must complete the two-year curriculum. They don't go forward until their junior year, so that's one thing. But that being said, there are some ways that AP can assist a, a student uh, in terms of more elective possibilities. Uh, so talk about how the assessment Yeah, I'll talk, and works. then again, specific questions, um, I, we, we can talk afterwards, but in gen generally, so at advanced placement, the university accepts scores of four and five, uh, and it, essentially for our curriculum, if your sons and daughters get a four in the English Lit, they have the opportunity to, to um, uh, replace Humanities 101 and 102, so they'll get credit for Humanities 101 and 102 and replace it with an elective that that is ostensibly towards their major or exploring what have you. We uh, also accept European history for the Social Science 102 curriculum core and then bio uh, biology for the first biology in the sophomore year. So that, that's it. Now, of course, many of your sons and daughters are taking psychology, economics, other things like that. And the university, again, grants credit towards Psych 101, for example, for, for scores of four and five. Yes, ma'am, go ahead. So the question is specifically about Sargent College, which is health and rehabilitation sciences, occupational therapy, therapy communication disorders, those, those fields. Uh, but I think more broadly, would they, when they go as juniors, do they have to play catch up? But I think the, that is probably on the minds of, of all of you, uh, not necessarily about Sargent College. So again, Stacey, I'm going to yeah, have so, you answer so that. Essentially, uh, it's, 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 it's four years, except unless you're in one of the programs in Sargent that is dietetics, which is five years, PT, which is six or seven, but, the, but it's, it's, it's essentially four years. And it, that's exactly right. You know, We are front-loading with the foundational liberal arts courses, whereas students in the other schools and colleges may weave them through the four years. Uh, but it's all, in the end, the same package. Yes, sir. So the question is to do, are there disadvantages in starting here as opposed to starting in one of the other schools and colleges? Well, we're not reliable narrators about that because we are fairly dedicated to this curriculum. Uh, let me just say the, the other part of that, and then we can, we can see if Meg or somebody else would have some ideas about, is, is there a perception of um, disadvantage? You have to understand this is a fixed curriculum. As I said this morning, all students at Boston University, one third of their bachelor's degree will be in what we call general education, foundation in liberal arts. The other colleges offer it in a different format, and it may be closer to what some of you took. Divisional studies, you did a list, picked two from column A to meet your humanities requirements, two from column B to meet your social science requirements. They may have been good courses, but there was no linkage. Um, there was, we happen to think this is a more powerful pedagogy, and our alumni tell us that all the time. We happen to think that being able to think from multiple perspectives to bring to bear different disciplines on the uh, problems of uh, the world uh, is a more powerful pedagogy. So I will say I'm not the most reliable narrator on what are the disadvantages, but uh, uh, 
Meg, do you want to say something that you might? Have? Jay has the mic. He's going to he's going to trump you, Meg, and then he'll pass. It, we'll pass it down. Well, I don't think there are any disadvantages. In fact, I would say there are advantages in that we're offering courses here that have to be taken anyway at the university, and the courses that have to be taken at the university that your sons or daughters will select will be selected on the basis of convenience when they're offered, but they wouldn't all cohere to any meaningful pedagogical or theoretical model. In other words, it's like a smorgasbord. And if you eat too much at a smorgasbord, you get indigestion. <laughs> we offer the whole meal here. We work together all year as a team of teachers to make sure that our courses integrate. So by the time the students finish, they have a very solid grounding in the liberal arts, which allows them to move seamlessly throughout the university when they encounter other courses that deal with somewhat the same subjects. So our courses are integrated in a very meaningful way for a full two years. And since we do team teaching, we meet each week to discuss how we're going to make things work. And we can offer interdisciplinary writing assignments and so forth. So it's a, it's a much more coherent package that we offer here. And we're very proud of it. Gosh, I've really put Meg on the spot to come up with the disadvantages. Um, the one disadvantage I can think of, which actually very much turned into an advantage, um, is the fact that your professors know who you are. <laughs> um, so that's kind of scary as an incoming student to know that, oh my goodness, I actually need to raise my hand in class and I need to participate in this discussion. Um, because if not, they're they're going to notice. Um, and that's part of that integration um, you know, policy and that that... Um, that mission of what the College of General Studies is, is that idea that your professors are getting together and they're having conversations about the students in their classes and you know they're gonna notice if you're not participating in that. Um, but that is such, it became such a huge advantage um, for me because it pushed me. I worked very, very hard. So that's another thing too. Students need to come into the College of General Studies realizing they're going to be challenged, they're going to be pushed and they're gonna work very, very hard. Um, and it's going to make a huge difference in the long run when, once I transitioned into the College of Communication and now even now, um, now that I've graduated, I've, I've really realized that I've got those, the, that foundation of wanting to build relationships with professors and with staff members and with my colleagues based on that foundation that I got here. Meg, what about anything, uh, co-curricular, uh, residence halls, anything that you saw as, you maybe talk a little yeah. bit about what that life is like. Yeah, I know a, that, that tends piece. to be a huge concern is this idea of our, you know, college general studies students in this bubble, are they only living amongst CGS students? Um, and that's really not the case. Um, I lived in West Campus in Sleeper Hall, which is where you ate lunch today. Um, and yes, my roommate was in CGS, however, uh, you know, the, the girls that lived beside us were in the School of Education and the College of Arts and Sciences. Um, as Dean Godding mentioned, I was involved with the Public Relations Student Society of America starting as a freshman, so I had that opportunity to get involved in co-curricular activities outside of the College of General Studies, which, which is, is key. And yes, students are going to have to put themselves out there and get involved and, and, you know, not be afraid to meet people, but I think that goes across the board at any college, at any university, in any program. Um, that's what college is about, is getting yourself out there and kind of stepping out of your comfort zone. But I don't think that was necessarily unique to CGS. Um, I felt very much integrated with the rest of my freshman class um, through those programs and opportunities that I experienced. Yes, ma'am, go ahead. What's the retention rate at the first year? We have a 93% retention rate. Uh, we are, and about, the, the, so we have a retention rate equal to or slightly better than the College of Arts and Sciences probably in part because of this connection. Uh, and uh, our graduation rate, at the students who start in the College of General Studies graduate at the same rates as the rest of the university. We're um, about 84% graduation rate, I think, at Boston University right now. We'd like for it to be just a little bit higher. Uh, but the students who start here, they're Zoomers like everybody else. Yes, ma'am. Can you speak a little bit about that change approach? What is the change mm -hmm. and how does it work together? Mm -hmm. Sure, sure. So I'm, forgive me for those folks uh, who are uh, um, coming to us from online. The question had to do with what is the retention rate. So I anticipated also graduation rate in my answer. And the, this question has to do with the team structure and how does it work. You will remember that this morning I actually showed you a schematic of three faculty members and an advisor representing a freshman team 
mix them up, change it, sophomore year, different faculty and an advisor. Uh, so does anyone want to pick up the question of how the team works beyond that? Yes. So sure. the, well, why don't, why don't, actually, I think, why don't we start with the student perspective and then uh, we can go to the faculty perspective. So the question has to do with how does the team structure work from the student perspective and then from the faculty perspective? So I can kind of just give you a picture to kind of, I don't know, I'm a visual learner, so that helps me. Um, so teams are made up of about, correct me if I'm wrong, about 90 to 100 students. 80 now. now, okay. I think, maybe 80. Okay, when I was here it was 100. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, so you have those, um, those three um, faculty members. So it's the three faculty members, an advisor, and a team of about 80 students. Um, so the way it works is when you're going to um, team lecture, so for social science and humanities um, and natural science, you will have a team lecture a week, um, and so you'll be with your entire team for that lecture. However, then those, are, those classes are also made up of discussion classes, which make up about 20 students, again, students within your team. Um, that you'll be in class with. And those discussion classes, they might be with, you know, this group of 20 students for this humanities discussion, but this group of 20 students for this natural science discussion. Um, so it varies. However, you stick with your team of 80 students. Um, from a student perspective, it was, I loved it. I mean, I, I love CGS, obviously. I wouldn't be <laughs> sitting here if I didn't. Um, but it was just a really awesome way to get to know my classmates, and it was nice to know that we could, honestly, one of the biggest perks was studying together. Um, that was a huge thing was to get together for group study periods because we were taking the same exams and we were in all the same classes, so we had that opportunity to do that. And we also had that opportunity to kind of develop with each other um, and to learn each other's strengths and weaknesses. And I think that's, it's really kind of a cool thing to take advantage of. We had the whole entire year to get to know one another um, and again, that kind of played into part come the capstone project. That's huge was that you had this opportunity to build these relationships with students that are in three of your four classes your whole year and then kind of, like I said, use those strengths and weaknesses to your advantage. Uh, let's take one of the faculty members, but as they're passing the mic, let me just say that it's a little bit uh, puzzling maybe because be aware, the faculty teach a discrete course. Matt teaches rhetoric. Peter teaches the natural science course. Jay teaches the social science course. Adam teaches the humanities course. There isn't team teaching on a daily basis in terms of all of it being uh, blended. The, the main thing is that they share the same students so that each week people meet in a team meeting with their advisor and can talk about students who are really progressing and shining and students who have certain interests and so there's a way it's it's as much a social unit as anything else from the students point of view so it's sort of what we say by a college within a college within a university there will be six freshman teams uh, starting in the fall and uh, those the way that sometimes people ask, well, how do, how do we select people for, for those teams? We don't select students. They come to summer orientation. Three people make friends. They say, let's try to get on the same team. That's how scientific it is. Um, and then one will defect because he will say, no, I really am pre-med, and I've got to get this one schedule that fits better for chemistry 101, so I've got to choose, would I rather be with you people, or would I rather take chemistry? So that's the kind of thing that goes on. That's how it works. So maybe a faculty member would like to comment also about what is it like from a faculty perspective sure, to be you, on Sure, you, you spoke quite well about it. Um, from a faculty perspective, the, the team alignment, the team structure is, 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 is ideal. We work with the students over the course of a whole year, so we really get to see um, the, the, the intellectual development and maturing uh, process of these students. The, I mean, what I always say is the difference between uh, Labor Day and Memorial Day is is profound, and you know we see it over the course of the year. Um, we, as Dean Wells said, we do meet together. Like I, this is my team right now this year. The, these the three of us uh, are a team, and uh, and yeah, thank you. Uh, and yes, and Dean Godnick as our advisor, which is an important aspect of it. Um, and we all meet once a week, uh, and you know it's. We, we know who's doing well, who's not doing well. I know if somebody's not attending Professor Corin's class or if she, he or she is not attending my class. But really, it's, it, rather than that sort of kind of disciplinary stuff, it's, it's a way to just share ideas. What's happening in your class? Uh, you know, is there something I'm reading in my class that we can bring into, into context in your class? 
Uh, Professor Busher and I led a group of students out on a, on a field trip to Walden Pond this year. So it just allows for that kind of, of, um, of, of interchange uh, and interplay, which uh, we, we all believe um, uh, facilitates and enhances the, the undergraduate general education experience. And as Dean Godnick sort of elbowed me here, uh, a key aspect of this really is the advising. The, the, the team structure um, allows uh, the advising to happen at a very intimate and very efficient way uh, so that the advisors are hearing directly from their students, faculty, how is this student doing in natural science or, or social science? Uh, and we can provide immediate feedback, which is then helpful, I would say essential, for the, for the advisors um, to uh, bring back to the students. So it's, it all works together. It's all of a piece. So, yeah. Hi. I, I think the team system is really what makes this such a powerful pedagogical model. Really, in, in no other general education structure that I know of in this whole country would a group of three people with PhDs who are doing research in their field spend the entire year with a, a single group of, of freshmen, um, you know, talking about them every week together and, and designing joint projects so that the courses reinforce one another. That to me is, is the secret of the success. It's not like you take one class and, and then you, you go to another class and it has nothing to do with the first class and then you go to a third class and it has nothing to do with the first two classes. Our classes reinforce one another so I think think you learn more and the learning comes in, in a package that your brain can hold on to and that you can um, pull from later on and that you can use for problem solving. Um, and, and really, I think it's, it's a good model for how people have to perform in graduate school and in the professions. Very few people work in isolation out in the professional world. They have to work in teams. They have to, they have to pull knowledge from different disciplines, different areas in order to solve a problem. We start that kind of thinking here with the, the, the the team model that we have. Uh, my, my colleagues have really been talking about connections, connections in terms of the courses we offer and connections with our students. And uh, we write numerous letters of recommendation and it's sometimes uh, strange when freshmen ask us to write letters of recommendation for graduate school or professional reasons uh, because they usually would generally ask uh, professors they've taken courses with at the upper divisional levels. So we always have to explain in our letters of recommendation that we're asked because we know them so well. I had a student who wrote to me uh, last year who was my student 25 years ago and he was changing professions and he asked me for a letter of recommendation. I remembered him, I just went back and dragged up the letter of recommendation I'd written for him 25 years ago. <laughs> And I added a few things because I stayed in touch with them. But that, those are the kinds of connections that we can offer here because of the way in which our whole program is set up. We know our students very well, and we treasure them. They're wonderful. Yes, go ahead. So the question is, uh, why do we have this particular structure? Uh, the uh, questioner uh, was commenting that her son uh, has a team structure like this at his high school. And I have to say that they got the idea from us. <laughs> and, and the reason I say that is this college has been around for 60 years. So we just celebrate our 60th anniversary this fall. And our founding fathers are credited in the literature with establishing the idea of team teaching in, in this case, higher education. But you have seen some um, examples of it, sometimes in other schools, like sometimes middle schools get organized around it. And I'm, I'm not kidding when I say that we founded it. So we exist for that reason, because the, our founding fathers thought that this would be a good model. I will tell you, we were established originally, I didn't talk too much this morning about the history of Boston University. We were established uh, as a division of 
the general college. Now, if you know about general education, higher education from Columbia and uh, University of Chicago, those, especially University of Chicago, I think have are their fingerprints all over our curriculum uh, because in the 30s and 40s, the idea of general education really caught fire. And so we had a very large general college at Boston University, and it was thought of as sort of the honors program of liberal arts and on this similar model. And our founding fathers uh, in 52, primarily to recruit World War II and Korean War veterans on the GI Bill, uh, established this notion of this PhD faculty, small cohorts, um, staying together for the two years, all of that. And over the years, Boston University, under John Silber and going forward, Boston University has become such a highly selective university, uh, and yet there is a way that we're able to adapt to that changing model of uh, we say, what I quoted you this morning, Michael Solana, who went on to University Professors Program, this curriculum adds up to something. We believe that this is the foundation of a liberal arts degree. And, uh, and that the major, if even in the professional schools, sit on top of it. So that's why we exist. We had a contingent from Drexel University who came to us this year to take a look at our model, and they had scouted around quite a lot. Um, and said very complimentary things about thinking that what we, the way we approach things that they thought we were the best. There are a couple of other models at Research One universities that are similar to us that we consider our peers, uh, Oxford College of Emory and NYU's liberal studies programs. In fact, I was just on the, an external review at NYU with the deans uh, uh, and uh, looking at the NYU program. So uh, there are a few models like it, but it's not easy to, it's not easy to get it started in 2013, if you know how higher education gets organized around departments of liberal arts and turf and, and uh, that kind of thing. So we haven't seen a lot of other programs start up. We're just 60 years old. That's why we exist. Yes, sir. Go ahead. Um, I'm curious about the uh, faculty advisors. Is it one per, per student? Yes. And how often do uh, they interact with students? Okay. So Okay, so, so the question has to do with advising. We have, so the advisor on the team is a, what we call a professional advisor. The faculty function as, uh, ad, they function as mentors in terms of talking with students about, okay, if I'm going to be an American Studies major, what will that mean? So the faculty often talk content, but the specifics of how the advising works on the team, Stacy, I'm gonna let you take that. Sure, sure. So. Um, it, that's a timely question uh, because um, we just, uh, at the end of the year, we survey our students about three or four questions, takes five minutes, what, what they think of advising. And predominantly, all of the answers are positive. Our advisors were very informed and helpful and things like that. But in terms of uh, any recommend, future recommendations, which, which, is, which is interesting, there were many that said we should have more mandatory meetings with our advisors, <laughs> which I found very interesting because um, you can see your advisor as many times as you want. So the advisor, that is their full-time job, folks. They, they are there for that group of 80 to 100 students, freshmen, and then they have a sophomore team. So in terms of mandatory, there's one mandatory at the beginning of the year, and then uh, there's one when they have to register. But there is a ton of outreach uh, that the advisors do to, to the students to say, come on in, let's chat. Uh, we have information sessions. The other schools and colleges in the fall will come here, and we'll have information sessions about what does it mean to continue to the College of Arts and Sciences or School of Management, et cetera. So um, you, these students, you get, your sons and daughters can meet with them once a week if they wanted to. The issue is that, that many of them don't. The ones who do, and I suspect Meg would attest to this, um, it's a much more um, qualitative and um, complete experience when you do meet with your advisor. You, your advisors are connecting you to resources at the university. Example, I just met with a student about a month ago. She's looking for an advertising internship. I know Eva Cantor has a job. She graduated last year. She's with an advertising, small advertising agency in Boston. This student has a meeting with her this weekend to do an internship this weekend, this, this summer. So it's that type of connecting. So in addition to having the sort of transactional advising where you take this course to get here and we, we map out the, the two and then the four years, there's also that, uh, that other piece of it, that, 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 that there's a benefit to meeting with the advisor, the connecting piece and the resource piece. If your sons and daughters enroll, the line you must learn when they call you, see your advisor. 
there, uh, because that's the place to begin. Uh, and then the advisor can do a lot of communication. Now, sometimes students will just come into a faculty member and you have a paper due and they've come in for an office hour with you and you're talking through it and then they begin to talk about some things that, that you know, say they're having some roommate challenges or whatever. I might talk them through it, but uh, the advisor is certainly set up to help them, as Stacy said, to find resources throughout the university and how to resolve these kinds of things. And, so and, and one more note about that. You know, years ago we had mandatory meetings and the, the, the students you know, sort of complained that, oh, it's a mandatory meeting, and many of them didn't show up. So we really, we really see, they're adults, and we, we see them, you know, we open the door, provide the resources, and they have to step, step through that door. And that's a message they will get repeatedly uh, at orientation and, and from us, but it really is a matter of them uh, owning, and they own their education here. Um, they certainly, you know, you guys are financing it, but they're the owners of it. Uh, and, and they've got to then uh, take, take, you know, step through that, that threshold. I would just add to that the, 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 the formal advising that Dean Godnick is talking about is, 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 is vital, but the, the informal advising that the faculty, because precisely because the faculty get to know your sons and daughters so well, I've, I, you know, it's, I, could, I couldn't even begin to count the number of times I've had a student come into my office to talk about what seems like an academic issue but becomes something else uh, because they feel comfortable, because they know me, and this is the same for all of my colleagues. And um, it's just, it really helps in a, in a lot of different ways. So there's this really strong formal and also very strong informal advising piece that, that goes, again, it's all of a piece. So I, I want to comment a little bit on that as well, that uh, I just got back yesterday from Chicago. Uh, as it's well publicized on the website, I'm stepping down from the deanship at the end of this year after 33 years at Boston University. And so I'm, I'm out there on the Tina Turner farewell tour. And uh, so I was in Chicago. I saw some of my former students from years ago, back 30 years ago. But there were two alums who were there, and they don't know it yet. But uh, Adam Sw uh, Victor Fuentes came up to me, who just graduated in 2004, and he said, is Professor Sweeting still there? I said, oh, yes. And he wanted me to be re remembered to him. And then another young woman who was um, Anna Briskman, who was the, uh, and she wrote a card to you, you know, so, okay. So we stay connected with our students, and that's why the advising piece, whether it be advisors or faculty, that's kind of uh, the, the thrill of working here. All the way to the back. Yeah. So the question has to do with how do professors um, teach a course that starts in anci with ancient uh, Greece and uh, has also film history or uh, any number of pieces, and that's true across all the divisions. So let me just say in, in, uh, in the big picture, we hire people with PhDs who are specialists who have to become generalists. We're fairly broadly educated. Uh, I will say my PhD is in 20th century British and American literature, but when I came here to interview for a job in 1980, I have a, a distributed minor in film and in philosophy. And I, I thought, well, they're interviewing me to teach the first year course in uh, liter the literature core in film. And they began asking a lot of questions about Plato and Aristotle, and it became fairly apparent to me that they were really thinking I was going to teach the second year history of ethical philosophy. I will tell you, and which I did for years, all the way through Capstone, I will tell you one of the things that happens, and I, I said we're fairly broadly educated for one thing, uh, we're teaching general education to first and second year students. I'm not teaching graduate students in, who are studying, who are writing a dissertation in Kant. And that the perspectives we bring to it are across a lot of different fields. We also are, talk about collaboration, people help each other a great deal. Uh, and maybe Jay or some other folks can talk about how it works on a divisional meeting, how you get together to talk about how you're going to teach the content. Yes, we meet once a week in the division of the social sciences to discuss pedagogy, <clears throat> how we're going to teach something. And since we hire specialists, it means that those who are hired, you have to realize, first of all, they have PhDs. They've gone through hell getting a PhD. So they know how to learn things fast. And they have to learn quickly. And we work together as a team to help folks make that transition. We assign a mentor 
to each new faculty member. That person sits in on classes and helps the person make that transition. We help each other. We have a collective file that we can turn to uh, that deals with the kinds of matters that we're going to be discussing each week in our meetings. So we work collectively as a, as a team of teachers uh, in order to figure out how to make this general education program work. And we all have to learn when we get here. But we're all good learners. That's why we have PhDs. So it's a stretch for us. But once we make that stretch, it's a home run. It really is. And uh, we continue to grow and develop as we exchange ideas with uh, faculty that come from a multitude of different disciplines. And that, in the long run, enriches what we do. Uh, yes. If, oh, oh, Adam, well, I was just since the, I think you did ask specifically about the humanities. Um, Professor Corn was talking about the social science, but it, it's the same sort of model. I mean, I, I work with the faculty in my division. We meet uh, once every two weeks or so, and we're always I always ask them, All right, "What are you teaching in your class right now? What are you teaching?" And we get these ideas. Um, this college that, that we share and openly share, it's it's a very collaborative effort. Uh, there's no question about it. All of us are trained in, 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 as, you know, this is the requirements of a PhD, and it seems to be getting narrower and narrower. Um, we think that for teaching uh, undergraduate general education courses, um, the best teachers are those who are can sort of, in a sense, step out of that, 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 that specialty. They may still work on that in their, in their research, um, but for their teaching, and we, we reward good teaching. That's what we, um, everyone here is an accomplished scholar, but our faculty are, are, are really evaluated as well, and, and if not even more so, on, on the quality of their teaching. And uh, the teachers who are able, the faculty who are able to sort of step out of that really sh small, small area of specialty uh, and to become generalists and who are, uh, you, know, you know, have the facility to move in and out of, of historical eras. Um, because our students aren't necessarily going to be in historical eras. And I, I think that, my, that our job is to help them move through historical eras and, and different genres, different approaches, different methods of inquiry. And that's, that's what we're looking for in our teachers, and that's what we reward in our hiring, our promotion, and, and salaries, and, and, and what have you. Yes, sir, go ahead. So, so the question has to do with how does a student continue uh, into engineering, and that is one of the continuation schools. Uh, I will tell you, uh, within Boston University, there aren't huge numbers of students trying to get into engineering. There are often a fair number going in the other direction, but we have had a, a students every year at CGS who come to us and develop, because they've talked to other students and they've begun to think about engineering, to think about the College of Engineering as a continuation. And so I know, and, I'm, and we're going to answer your question, uh, and I'm going to have Stacy uh, pick it up specifically, but you're going to, if you have very specific questions about specific, you know, how, what about pre-med or what about those things, we're going to stay after and you can come up and ask us individual questions about those kinds of things as well. But Stacy, talk a little bit about what we did around engineering. Um, yeah, so, so engineering is, is pretty compressed and it's, it's, it's doable in four years uh, and, and, and requires, um, a, depending on the program in engineering, um, a, a, several, a couple of summers at least, summer work. Uh, we do have, in the instance of engineering, the opportunity for students to have an early transfer. So, as Dean Wells said, two-year program, but we do have these two schools, fine arts and engineering, whereby which students can uh, transfer early. Qualify in. Qualify in. So, fine arts, it would be based on a portfolio audition. Engineering, it would be based on the student's uh, academic performance in calculus the freshman year, as well as required summer work in the sciences the, f the summer between freshman and sophomore year. So they have Bs in those prerequisite courses, and they pass a uh, mathematics diagnostic, then they, they, they will be able to transfer early to engineering. So the main thing, again, I would say, that student needs to con be in touch with the advising, because we want to start from summer orientation, talking to students about what are your plans and how can we make sure that uh, you're going in the, in the direction that uh, suits you in terms of your aptitude and in terms of your interests. Uh, and what happens if they think they're going down one path, School of Management, for example, and say, take the first gateway course and say, 
not for me. So uh, that's why it's really important to keep working with the advisor and how do you make uh, kind of a, a detour and make a different turn so that you go right on as a junior and complete. Now I'm going to make sure that everybody has a shot to ask first question. Uh, I'm going to take a couple more. I'm going to give you a three minute warning. And uh, then, as I said, we will stay here and answer any of your individual questions. Yes, sir. Could you explain the capstone project again? Okay. About okay. Uh, so, uh, as I said to you, 600 sophomores came today to deliver their 50 page policy papers in here. And uh, they will, so they research and write a 50 page policy paper on a real world problem in groups of about six or seven. Uh, and we hope they're still friends after that. Sometimes not so much. Um, and they have four weeks to do it. And then they come in on what we call capstone submission day, turn in the capstones, and then they, uh, over the next two weeks, these faculty will be having oral exams with the students. They take, each group has a two hour oral exam with their team of professors examining the uh, problem as it's put forward and the solutions as they have rendered it. As a group as a group <laughs> as a group and by the way the notion of capstone we have something called capstone that has been in place and called that for 40 years in this college and now you suddenly hear lots of things about capstone but that has been in this in place here for a very long time uh, Okay, go ahead, Peter. Okay. I was just trying to make sure that we get a few more questions in. Go ahead. Uh, just, I just want to say one thing from a faculty point of view, that the Capstone Project is the true assessment of the worth of our program. What we see come out of this project is polished scholars, and believe it or not. Now, I'm not saying that if you read these that the language is always perfect, but these are polished scholars, and they present it to They sit with us in an oral examination for two hours, we ask them the most challenging questions about all aspects from the humanities, social sciences, and even sciences in many of these projects. And it is unbelievable to see the growth in these students. And that, that's really, it's mm -hmm. truthfully the most meaningful thing that, that I go through. And mm -hmm. I think my colleagues do And I do think too. for them, for, for when you think of uh, six sophomores who know virtually nothing about the specifics of a topic, and in four weeks have become experts on it. And that's why we believe it really is incredible preparation for their lives, because they are going to have to problem solve, do massive amounts of research, move through data, synthesize, uh, suggest a uh, solution, and at the same time, manage interpersonal relationships, uh, conflict resolution. What happens if four people say, and I think this is the, the solution to the problem. I mean, there, there's a lot that goes into that's not just the writing of the paper of the capstone process. We consider it, uh, that's why we say this is something that it all adds up to something, and capstone is that very thing, the capstone. Uh, someone back here had a question also? Yes, sir. Okay, so the question is, how do we measure success? As you've been listening to this uh, analysis of the program. Of course, uh, we have metrics on the typical kinds of things, of retention rates, graduation rates, grade point averages, all of those things, back for decades in this college. Um, and that's one measure of success. I would say another measure of success is something that I alluded to of being in touch with students back to the very first year. I say I was a, I think I was a good teaching fellow and I got my PhD at the University of Wisconsin, but I'm not in touch with any student I ever taught at the University of Wisconsin. And I am, partly because that's not the life of a graduate student. You're looking for finishing your dissertation and moving on and getting a tenure track position. But I am in touch with students that I had back to my very first year and getting to hear their stories. We have, we have, uh, I am old enough to have students whose children have finished at this college. And Jay will say, <laughs> grandparents. grandparents. Uh, so that's another measure. But uh, Matt, would you like to add something to that? Um, I'll, I'll mention uh, there are multiple ways um, that we measure success, I think. And some are more formal and some are more informal. Um, I'm going to mention two. And then I thought I'd hand it over to Dean McKnight because she's really responsible for uh, the more formal assessment of the program. 
So uh, in informal ways, I mean, one of the ways that we measure success is, is by reading student evaluations. And, and uh, as chair, I read all the student evaluations, so hundreds and hundreds, and we evaluate both the 101 course and the 102 course, I read them all. But I'm not just reading them to find out how much students like the professor or even like the material. I'm reading them to figure out, okay, what are the strengths and weaknesses of this course? If a student says it's not challenging enough, how can we address that? If a student says that, um, uh, you know, that the, uh, so the students in her class or his class were not always doing the reading. That's something we need to address, et cetera. So evaluations are one way. I think another way, and it's even more informal, but, um, you know, we have our students for a whole year. And from September to April, I can see how these students have grown. Right now, my students are doing uh, research papers um, using, you know, the full resources of a university library. All the things that I was teaching them back in September about how to structure um, a, a paper and how to uh, formulate a paper uh, at the college level, these are things that they're doing pretty much naturally by rote now without my having to talk about those elements at all. And they're, they're building in a whole lot of new skills that I've been teaching this semester. And so, you know, I can see a lot of growth there. So it's not formal assessment, but um, I, you know, I'm very confident that I can see it, and I think the other faculty in, in my division um, are looking at those things all the time as well. So I'll just hand it over. And we're going to have Dean McKnight have the last. Uh, uh, no, don't be rushed. I I'll just want to give a, a heads up that when we conclude, uh, we will sign off with the online folks, and then we'll stay up here to answer any questions that you have, because some of you still have uh, questions to be asked. Uh, Natalie. Thanks. Uh, so I'm glad you asked about assessment because I do think it's important and we do have a formal assessment uh, project uh, that's going on right now and has been for a couple years funded by two generous grants from the Davis Educational Foundation. So we have all of our students archive all of their formal work on e-portfolios. These are electronic portfolios. It's basically like an academic Facebook. So we have a record of everything they've done while they've been here with us. And then we've trained this group of 10 faculty members and myself um, to uh, evaluate their writing and their projects using a rubric that we've designed together. And if you want to see our rubric, somebody else mentioned rubric earlier, um, it's on our website. So if you go to www.bu.edu slash CGS slash CITL for Center for Interdisciplinary Teaching and Learning, you can look under ePortfolio and Assessment and see more about it. But we use this rubric. We've trained these faculty actually really for two years now so that we can establish inter-rater reliability. And let me just get down to the, the brass tacks here. After you know, looking at about 120 um, students' e-portfolios last year and using this rubric, which has quantitative values, we can show that our students progress between 22% and 30% in all of the competency areas that we look at. And national um, like collegiate learning assessment tests are showing at most about 7% in most colleges. So, and we're going to go into another uh, summer of collecting assessment data, and we will be continuing this for years. So this is, you know, these are early results, but very promising. So we have numbers, and happy to share them with you. Thank you for asking that. <laughs> so, folks, it is one minute after two, and you are supposed to be meeting your sons and daughters. They've been upstairs, as I said to you, listening to the reliable narrations from our students. Uh, we want you to enjoy the Boston University campus. Uh, for those online, we're, thank you for joining us. We're going to uh, end the uh, telecast at this point. And those who are still in the room who want to ask us questions, please come forward. Thank you so much. And again, congratulations to your sons and daughters.